All right. Good morning and welcome to Wednesday in the Word. And uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, hope you've downloaded the uh, study guide for today and you have those in the room already have one, I'm assuming. And um, today we're going to deal, last week we dealt with grace. This week we're going to deal with the law and grace and the relationship between those two. Um, needed to, we need to get those things understood and so we'll get to that in, um, in just a minute. And uh, I mentioned as I turned this on, I hope the internet's going to cooperate with us this morning, but uh, we'll do the best we can. That's all I can do. I don't have no control over that. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here to open your word this morning. Uh, now open our hearts as we examine it and uh, help us to understand it and then apply it to our lives. Bless those who are watching uh, today or at a later time, and I pray that you will um, shower us with your grace and blessings that we may be a blessing to others that we meet along the way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The purpose of the law was never to save. So, if you, if you hear people say in the Old Testament they were saved by the law, in the New Testament you're saved by grace, that's not true. Um, the law was not given in order to save. The law simply was given to reveal the sinfulness of man. And so in the law, what you discover is the perfection of God and the imperfection of man. Um, that's why the law, and we'll get into this a little bit, but uh, the law, um, that's why in order to be saved, perfection is required. Well, how would we know what perfection is if there is no standard uh, to judge? And so God gives the law to show what's required. In order to get to heaven, you're going to have to keep the law. Well, who could do that? Nobody, because we're sinful. That's why Jesus came, and he did keep the law. He kept it perfectly, and he did, again, he did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So it's not, uh, you know, we start talking about keeping the law. I may keep it, and I may get 40% uh, of it, and Joy may get 55%, and Jesse may get 75%. It really wouldn't matter because, <laughs> you don't think she'll get that high? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was being nice. Um, uh, it really doesn't matter because if it's not 100%, it doesn't matter. You either keep it all or it, it, you, you're not going to get into heaven because you kept 99% of the law. Um, it was 100% or nothing. So the whole purpose of the law was to simply reveal to us that we are incapable of meeting the standard that God has required. You see, we if you, if you start trying to uh, explain this in terms of, that we would understand. Go back to school. Uh, there's a standard in school, but a passing grade, uh, you didn't have to get a hundred every time in order to pass. None of us would have passed. Um, you know, you had a hundred, uh, 90 to a hundred was an A, and 80 to 90 was a B, and so forth, so on. Um, in, in this case, the law is a hundred percent or nothing. You either keep it all or you've kept none of it. And so uh, when we start talking about that, um, the, the, the problem is that there, there basically are two groups uh, in, in this whole debate. Uh, some people argue uh, and argued back in, in Bible days, and Paul addresses it, that um, the more sin abounds, the more God's grace can abound. In other words, so uh, the more we sin, uh, the more opportunity God has to show us his grace. Well, that's not, uh, Paul said that's not right. You, you, don't, you don't do that. Uh, then there are those who live, that, that's, the, that's the grace part. That's all about grace. Then there's the legalism of the Pharisees. So you've got those who are legalistic who say, well, Yes, you do have to have faith in Jesus, but you also have to do this. You have to read your Bible. You have to um, 
tithe, you have to go to church, you have to do this. Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says that either. And so those are the extremes. You've got to keep the law, see. Or throw the law out the window and just do whatever you want to because God's grace is going. So those are the two extremes. Both of them are in error. Anytime you start, uh, well, so-and-so must not be a Christian because they don't come to church. That's not necessarily true. You can't judge that based on those legalistic kinds of things. And again, I'll remind you that uh, we have a tendency to judge others based on what they do, not based on what we do. It's easy for us to pick out their sins, and it's easy for us to make a list of sins of things. Here are things that you don't do if you're a Christian. We come up with our list. I'll guarantee you that if we came up with a list, the things that we put on it would be things that we don't do. We wouldn't put anything on it that, that we do, you see, because then it makes us look bad. But we can look at all of them out there and say, yeah, y'all should be doing this, 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 and this, because well, I do it. That's legalism. The other extreme was, oh, just go do whatever you want to do, because the more you sin, the more God has grace to cover all that. So both of those are uh, in error. We live in what we call um, the age of grace, the, the, the church age. And um, so God has displayed his grace to us. Jesus kept the law perfectly, and so we're no longer under the law in that sense because Jesus fulfilled the law, and now we are complete in, in Christ. So that's where we're going to, to move with this as we go along. The, the law provided a perfect standard by which man could measure himself morally uh, and spiritually. So in the law, again, you see the perfection of God and the imperfection of man. And um, so if, if, and we'll get to this in a minute, um, I don't know whether it's the first thing that I, the first passage of scripture that I put up there or not, we're going to spend some time in Galatians. And in, in, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul deals with this and talks about how the law brings a curse. And, um, but the, after faith has come, this is Galatians 3.25, after faith has come, we are no longer under a taskmaster or under a tutor, under the law. And so that's, that's sort of where we're going to head this morning, and we'll, we'll begin to look at it. So let's look at the purpose of the law. The law was given uh, so that we might know what sin is. If you didn't have a standard, you wouldn't know what sin is. How do you know that something is a sin? Um, in Romans chapter 3, uh, Paul talks about uh, the wages of sin is death. But before he gets there, in Romans 3 verse um, 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, or by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the purpose of the law was to tell us that we were sinners. The law is given so that we would know what sin is. Uh, if you look at Romans uh, 7, for example, um, Paul says in verse 7, Romans 7, 7. What shall we then say? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Uh, in other words, you wouldn't know what sin is if somebody hadn't told you what the, the definition was. You wouldn't know covetousness was a sin unless the Bible says you shall not covet. That's not something you would have come up with on your own. So the law declares that we are guilty before God. Now go back to Romans 3 in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, he's going to end up in verse 23 saying what? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So nobody, because the law exists, all you have to do is look at the law. And we find out very quickly that everybody is guilty. That's what Paul says. 
he says, it, it, the law, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. So nobody can say, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not guilty of breaking the law. I'm not guilty of, of sin. And uh, in other words, Paul says, all the world may become guilty before God. And then he'll go on to say, for um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 14, here's what uh, David says. So Psalm 14, verse 1, you know that one uh, because it says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. We know that verse. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. So even when you say, you know, somebody will die, and you say, well, they were such a good person. Mm, according to what? Um, you know, according to your standard of goodness? I, I don't know, but because the Bible says there's none good. Um, he goes on to say, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They've all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Not a single one. So the law declares that we are guilty before God. And so then back to, um, go back to Romans and in after that, go back to verse um, 10, because that's where Paul quotes David from that psalm, and he says, There is none righteous, no, not one. I don't know how much clearer uh, we can be on that. Uh, so when you, know, when you meet somebody, when, when we say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, nobody can stand up and say, Well, that, you must be talking about somebody else. You can't be talking about me. No, the Bible says there is none righteous. No, not even one, not even you. <laughs> it's as good as you think you are. Uh, so the law is given so we can know what sin is. It's declaring when we read the law what we discover is we're guilty. All of us are guilty before God. So the law is given, according to Romans 7, to show the real nature of sin. So now Paul's going to, in, in, in chapter 7, going to give sort of a personal testimony. Uh, and he's going to talk about the effect that sin had or effect that the law has in his own life. And when he got saved, when Paul got saved, he, he, he basically is going to say, I got a new revelation about all of this. I, be, I, I begin to understand it in a in a way that I had not understood it before. Let's just read all of that, and then uh, we'll come back and look at it. So uh, Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was, once alive, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So, um, in your own life, and we talk about the age of accountability, a child, goes. they don't know, they don't understand what's right and wrong. They're not born with that ability to understand the difference between sin and, and, uh, and, and not sin. But there comes a point in your life where all of a sudden that begins to take effect and you begin to know that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. And you've reached that age. And, and Paul said there was a time when, when I didn't even know. I didn't know any better. And then all of a sudden, I'm old enough, and I begin to see the law, and the law says you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do this, and I'm thinking, oh, I do that. I do that. So now I'm guilty. Therefore, verse 12, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? No, certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, 
sold under sin. So Paul says, at one point, I was alive without the law, but when the law came and I began to understand it, I began to understand that I was guilty before God. I, I'm guilty of this. I've, I've broken the law. And the law, verse 12, the law from God is holy. God is holy. The law is holy. And, and, and verse 13, sin is exceedingly sinful when you measure it by the standard of the law. See, what we do is we, we tend to uh, say, well, it's not quite that bad. Um, I may not have, you know, okay, so in, in, in Matthew, Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And the Pharisees said, exactly right, and we haven't. We, we have kept that law. And Jesus said, but I say unto you, that any man who looks on a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery in his heart already. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, now, what did the, if they were honest, what would they have had to say? Uh-oh, we're guilty. See, and, and so as they understood, if you, if you just take the law and say, okay, I'm going to keep it right to the very, uh, I didn't commit adultery. Jesus said, but you don't understand the whole meaning of, of sin. Sin is more than just the action. Sin begins in, and James says, sin, sin begins in the thought process. And so Paul said, the more I understood this, the more I realized how sinful I really was. I, didn't, I, I wasn't aware. That's why the law was important. It wasn't that anybody was going to be able to keep the law. We've already established that the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. So nobody can keep it is to show you just how sinful you really are. So the law was given to Moses, and we'll get to that in a minute, but the law is given to show us the nature of sin, to show us just how bad it is. So the law uh, becomes added to the Abrahamic covenant. I want you to turn to Galatians 3, and we'll look again at that. So in Galatians chapter 3, And we'll start reading in verse uh, 5, actually. Well, let's go back to verse 1. Uh, Galatians 3, 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and now you're being made perfect by the flesh? In other words, the Galatians were now saying, yeah, we got saved by faith, but we're going to be made perfect by doing the law, keeping the law. And, and Paul says, whoa, you're, you're confusing this whole thing. Uh, you're, have you suffered so many things, verse 4, in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you get saved? Just as Abraham, here we go, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. See, the law didn't come until when? Moses. So what about Abraham? Abraham didn't even have the law, right? Hadn't been written down at that point. Moses hadn't gotten the Ten Commandments. How was Abraham saved? He believed God, same as you, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, Know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That's not blood kin to Abraham. That's not talking of, this is talking about uh, spiritual sons of Abraham. How are we connected to Abraham? By faith. By faith Abraham was saved. By faith you're saved. And the scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in, all you, in you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. I'm just like Abraham. You're just like Abraham. We believed in the promises of God. So the, the, the covenant, uh, the law was added because of transgression. Here's verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law, they're under the curse. It is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident because what did the Bible say? And, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, Paul is, the just shall live by the law. No, it's not right. They live by faith. The just don't live by the law. The just live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, to your seed, who is Christ. This I say, that the law, which was 430 years later. So Abraham lived, and 430 years later, you got the law. The law cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So, make sure you understand, how was Abraham saved? By believing God. That was the covenant that God made with Abraham. 430 years later, the law comes. Now, now that they have the law, does that negate Abraham's faith? Does that mean Abraham couldn't be saved because he didn't keep the law? No. The law is added to the Abrahamic covenant so that we can see that faith is necessary. All right? You follow me? Uh, verse 19, For what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, and he's already told us who the seed was, is who is it? Jesus. All right? until the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So the law, faith in God, was Abraham. They add the law, God adds the law 430 years later to show people because of their sinfulness that faith was necessary. Back to Abraham. Until such time as somebody could come and completely fulfill the law. Who did that? Jesus. That's why we say we're, we're not under the law in that way. So the law is the plumb line. That's the plumb line that is so you can see how uneven our lives are without Christ. So Paul tells us that uh, Old Testament saints as well as New Testament saints are saved by grace, not of the law, because Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Uh, the law is added to that covenant 430 years later um, as a way so people can see the need for salvation. So God made a promise to Abraham, he kept it. That's what verse 18 says. If the inheritance is of the law, Is no longer a promise. See, if, 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 and he would have said then, Abraham's covenant back here was no good anymore. But God had made a promise to Abraham. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So the law was added to the covenant and the promises of God. And the key word there is, um, in verse 19, until... What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come. Until Jesus could get here. So the law implanted in the heart of man this sense of sin and need for a Savior. Uh, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's what Paul clearly says that in verse 11. And substantiate the fact uh, of that. He quotes Habakkuk, uh, the Old Testament prophet, the just shall live by faith. Um, so verse 11 is very important. Uh, no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, because the just shall live by faith. The law was given that we might see how sinful we are. Um, 
it, it, it's 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 the it shows us how crooked we are. You know, the plumb line is the straight line, and we compare ourselves to that. And we see just even. Even a little crook, I mean, you might not, I might not be as bad as somebody, but there's still a little crookedness in that line. It's, it, it's not plumb, right? It's not plumb unless it is absolutely perfect, straight. Um, th that's an interesting concept, by the way. Go, let's, let's just look at it. I didn't put it up here. You can, I think we got some time. Go to um, the book of Amos. And chapter 7. And Amos has a vision of the plumb line. That's where this comes from. Amos chapter 7, verse 7. Isaiah mentions it too. But here's the vision. Um, Amos 7, 7. Thus God showed me. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. So the plumb line doesn't make you straight. The plumb line shows you how crooked you are. That's, that's, that's the purpose of that. So the law was added because of transgressions that we might see how sinful we really are. Um, Paul also says the law is given in order that being found sinners by the standard of the law, all of us might be saved through faith in Christ. Once you see it, hopefully, uh, then the Holy Spirit begins to convict you of sin and you see that uh, Christ is the fulfillment of this and our salvation is in Him. So I, I, I get a, the law implants in my heart my sense of sin, but that'd be a, if, if that's all it did, uh, that'd be a terrible thing, right? To just live all your life with just this sense of there's no hope. But it also implants in my heart the need for a Savior. So now, you know, that's why we hear missionaries tell stories of going over somewhere, uh, someplace that's not heard about Jesus, and, and they'll start preaching about Jesus, and somebody will say, I knew there had to be somebody who could fix this problem that we all knew we had. And you've come and told us it was Jesus. That's why missions are so important. Because there are people out there who know, because they've lived in the world, they see that they know something's not right. I, I'm, I, you know, I can't, I can't do enough. Uh, you, you think about people. I mean, we all know people who, who, who think that they're going to get into heaven because they've done enough good, good works, and so they just try to them, they work themselves to death trying to do good, and it just never is enough. How do you know when you've done enough good? <laughs> well, you, you don't. And you can't. And so there are people out there waiting to hear, you don't have to do it. God did it for you. And he, oh, that takes away all that guilt from, from not being able to be good enough. So that's the purpose of the law. The law is implanted so that we might sense our sin, but we almost, uh, also might see the need for a Savior. Jesus is born under the law. And uh, that's so, back to Galatians. We were in Galatians 3, now just move over to Galatians 4. And verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, now go back, you remember what he said in, in um, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, what, what the purpose of the law served. It was added because of transgressions until the seed could come to whom the promise was made. Now... Verse 4 of chapter 4, When the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Law hadn't been fulfilled, had it? Nobody had been able to do it. Adam couldn't do it. 
Abraham couldn't do it. Moses couldn't do it. Nobody that had ever lived could fulfill the law. To redeem, verse 5, those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So Jesus, you go back and you look at um, in Luke chapter 2, after Jesus is born, what does Mary and Joseph do? They take him to the temple and he meets uh, Anna, uh, the prophetess that's there. Why did they take him to the temple? That's part of the ritual. He was to be circumcised. That's part of the law. See, So Jesus is born under the law. So he was offered according to, the, um, Luke 2 uh, says he's offered at the temple according to the law. So Mary and Joseph were just doing what they were supposed to do. And Jesus is born under that. But he came, uh, Matthew 5, 17, he, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to just do away. Oh, you don't need the law anymore, so that's all. I came to fulfill it. The requirement of God was still intact. In order to have a relationship with God, you had to keep the law perfectly. So, you couldn't do it. Somebody had to do it for you. That's the doctrine of substitution. Jesus did that, so he wasn't going to just destroy it. Say, well, all, all that never made any difference anyway. That didn't matter. Now all you have to have is me. Now, why do we have to have Jesus? Because he fulfilled the law on our behalf. He did for us what we could not do. And so he lives in perfect obedience to the law. Not one time did he ever sin. Never had a bad thought. Never did anything. He was in perfect obedience to the law. And he confirmed the promises that were made um, to the fathers under the law. In, in Romans, um, just write this down. I'll turn over there. That way you don't have to flip so much. In Romans 15, verse 7, um, Paul says, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. What fathers? Old Testament. Old Testament. To confirm what... Abraham believed that the seed was going to come who was going to finally fulfill the necessary requirements and then you know, 430 later, years later it's the law and so they all believed God. I've, I've explained it this way. Here's, here's a point in time. This is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Anybody on this side of it, this is the Old Testament saints. They're looking for it to happen, right? They're waiting for it to occur. They have faith that it's going to occur. Everybody on this side, and that's me and you, what are we doing? We're looking back toward that event that it did occur. They were waiting for it to occur. We are looking back that it did. But there's a, there's a time, a, a specific point in history where Jesus came and fulfilled the law those who believed it was going to happen were saved. Those who believed that it did happen are saved. Does that make sense? And so Jesus comes not to destroy it. He comes to fulfill it. And he fulfilled all types of law. Uh, by, uh, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's what um, Paul said in Galatians 3. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. How? By the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus redeems us from the, the, the curse of the law. So let's look at before and after. Before, so sin, we know sin was in the world before the law. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned against God. But the law simply gave it a name. The law revealed sin to be a transgression against God and to convince the sinner that he had done something wrong. Prior to the law, they knew it was wrong, but they didn't know exactly why. Abraham. But all of a sudden, Moses gets the law. Oh, okay, now this makes sense. You shall not murder. You shall not lie. You shall, and all the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of it, comes into, into play to show that any time we sin, and, and we know this now looking back at Genesis 3, 
the sin that Eve and Adam committed was a transgression against God. It wasn't that they just did something wrong that they shouldn't have done. It was they transgressed what God had determined to be the standard. Here's what you are to do. Here's how you are to live. And they had their instructions, and what did they do? They were disobedient to that. So the law came from God then all of a sudden with specific penalties. Um, we had to be convinced that we needed a... Um, and the, the only specific penalty for sin uh, that was before the law was death. What did, you know, um, you shall surely die. Uh, and they did die. But they didn't die physically immediately when they sinned, Adam and Eve, but they died spiritually. Their relationship with God was broken at that point. And so that's the only specific penalty that's given uh, prior to that. God said, the day that you eat there uh, of the tree, you shall surely die. So there was no law. But now after the law is given, Moses, there's specific penalties. When you read through uh, the, uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus is all about if, 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 if somebody murders somebody, here's what's supposed to happen to them. If, if this happens, this is, what, this is the penalty for that. that the, that's what the law did. The law gave specific penalties for um, what happens when somebody sins. Um, the law came from God with detailed instructions. Um, the law didn't produce sin. Sin was already here. <laughs> you know, before the law, people did, Cain murdered Abel, right? Um, there was no law then that said, thou shalt not murder, but it's still a, a sin against God. They just didn't realize, there, what's the penalty? It was God dealing with them. Um, the law showed the true nature of sin. So let's, let's just look at some of these passages that will help give some explanation. So Romans 4. Let's start at verse 13, and then verse 15 is the one I want you to look at. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. This is uh, Romans 4.13. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect. You understand that? If... Abraham was saved or anybody was saved by the law Jesus was not necessary because keeping the law would have saved you you, you would need a relationship with Jesus then we would be in a gospel of works who does it the best who keeps the most of it because verse 15 so read 14 again for if those who are of the law are heirs Faith is made void and the promise is made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For, there is no, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. And the transgression is against God. So, go back to, let me give you an example, David and Bathsheba. Who did David sin against? Bathsheba, certainly. I mean, um, her husband, Yep. But when he comes to write Psalm 51, he says to God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Transgression, sin, is ultimately against God. If, if the law was all that there was and there's no relationship with God, then when something happens between me and you, all I have to do is apologize to you, and you apologize to me, and we go about our business, and, and, um, and that's the end of it. But when I sin against you, I've not just sinned against you. I've sinned against God, because God is the one who set the standard. You didn't set the standard. Matter of fact, you can set a standard, and th so that's why people don't get along with one another right now. Uh, people have this expectation of, of people. So... Uh, I've got this expectation. And then all of a sudden, you don't meet my expectation. Well, then I'm, I'm crossed the log with you. And, uh, but does it really matter? I don't have any right to set the expectation for you to start with. 
You know, I had to learn a long time ago that, and I've said this many times, if I please people and I don't please God, then it doesn't make any difference. If I please God and I don't please people, I've done what I was supposed to do. Because your expectation of me, you, you know, and you know that, uh, people get mad at you because you didn't do something they wanted you to do. And then you, didn't, you didn't need to do it, you didn't have to do it, all, but they just get, well, you should have done so and so. Now, now, they don't ever do that for you, but they want you to do it for them, right? All right, you can't live your life that way, or you'll be miserable because you'll spend your whole life trying to please everybody else. Ultimately, you have to please God. And that's, that's what Paul's talking about here, that we're, we, we, we're pleasing God. In, in chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And that's where you know, they got that idea that, oh, well, then if grace abounded much more, if I sin more, there's more grace. Well, that's convoluted. <laughs> that's taking advantage of the grace of God. That's presuming. See, if, if that's the case, if I, if I have that thought process, then I think I deserved God's grace, and I didn't. So I'll just sin more so that God can, it, it'll make God happy. Because he gets to give me more grace. You're an imbecile. <laughs> if you think that. Um, don't presume, God didn't have to give you the grace that he did give you, right? I mean, any grace that we had is unmerited. We didn't deserve it. And so uh, the law enters so that the, the, we, we understand that the offense is against God. And so God is the one. Who, uh, who, who forgives. Um, so the law stirred sin within the human heart. Um, in chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Note, um, he says that when we were in the, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. Um, the law stirred up sin and guilt because blame could be placed. Let me give you an example. Um, as a parent, if you tell your child, um, don't go in there. There, there's a closet right there. I've got something in there. Don't go in there. Now, I'm telling you, if you go in there, it's going to be trouble. Before you told them, they probably never even had any, they didn't even know the closet was there. They hadn't paid any attention to it. But now, all of a sudden, you said, don't do that. Now, what are they going to do? They're going in there. They're going to try to find a way to get in there. They're going, why? Because there's just something about you telling me I can't that rouses up that desire to show you, you know, we, we struggle with it. We call them the terrible twos um, with children. And um, they are terrible because they are trying to uh, assert their dominance. Um, you know, my, my twin girls now are, are getting to, I can, I can do it. I want to do it on my own, you know. Well, no, you can't, you can't, uh, and it makes them mad if you, and that, that's just normal. Well, in the same way, sin, the same sins were committed before the law. But now, all of a sudden, the law points it out. And now, we begin to, um, it, 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 it rouses up those desires within us, Paul says. He says, once we had the law, then... Um, it's all stirred up within us. We want to go in the closet even though we were told we were not supposed to because I want to prove I can. You're not going to tell me what I can do. You're not going to, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, so look at verse um, 5 again. Um, 
when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. In other words, we're, we're going to sin. It's, it's what I've tried to explain, you know, as a child, uh, we did a whole lot, we committed a whole lot of sins because we didn't know any better. The sin that you and I commit today as adults, 95 to 99% of it is stuff we chose to do. We knew better, and we did it anyway. Why in the world would we do that? We knew better, and we still did it. See, that's what Paul's talking about here. When you're in the flesh, there's something in there that just says, I'm going, I'm going to have my own way. It, Eve had that very same issue. That's why she ends up, uh, she and Adam end up eating the forbidden fruit because all of a sudden the, the, the serpent says, you know, God's holding out on you. Um, he, don't want you to, he don't want you to know. That, you know, the reason I may have told you not to go in that closet as a child was because there's something in there that could harm you. And I don't want that to happen. Well, and, and so we've, we've justified it by saying, well, sometimes you just have to learn lessons the hard way. Well, in this case, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. So th that, that's, that's what the law has done. L look at the contrast uh, then that happens. So the law prohibits. Grace gives or invites. The law condemns. Look how negative that is. Prohibit, condemn. Grace redeems. I have freedom. You know, that's where, and then that's where all of a sudden they begin to misuse that freedom again and say, well, if I've got the free, I can do anything I want to because God's grace is going to cover it. Well, that's a misuse of the grace of God. Law condemns, grace redeems. The law curses, grace blesses. The law was given by Moses, John says, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law demands obedience. Complete, total, 100% obedience. We can't do that, can we? We can do our best, but our best is still not perfect. Grace gives us the power to obey what God has called us to obey. The law is done away with in Christ because He fulfills it. Grace is written in our heart. Grace abides forever. Um, the, the law says, the soul that sins shall die. Grace says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall live. See the difference in, in how those two things uh, come about. And so um, it's an interesting uh, study to, to see that the, the purpose of the law was not to give you a list of rules of do's and don'ts and those kind of things. It was to show us the impossibility that we, we didn't even have the ability to do that to begin with. Somebody was going to have to do it on our behalf. Jesus did it on our behalf, and so now we don't put our faith in our works or in the law. We put our faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so because of that, I have salvation. Not because of any works, Paul says, not by any works that you do. It's, by, it's completely by the grace of God. So that's just a very interesting, I, I think, a very interesting study to look at the, the contrast between um, how the law operates and how grace operates. I'm thankful that we live under grace, aren't you? Um, that's, thank God for grace. And uh, so let's do that, let's pray, and then we'll be done. Father, we thank you for your grace. Uh, because the more we look at this, the more we realize uh, we're incapable of doing what is necessary uh, to have a right relationship with you. And so I, I'm thankful that you did for us what we were incapable of doing. Now help us. After salvation, we are saved for good works, so we are supposed to do good works, and we're supposed to do the right thing, and we're supposed to live the right kind of life, and so help us to do that. Grace gives us the power to do that. Uh, we can't do that on our own. Uh, it is only by your grace that we're able to achieve that. And so uh, help us this day to live according to your plan for us by your grace 
through our faith in Jesus Christ who has uh, fulfilled the law and completed everything that was necessary so that we might have salvation. Uh, bless us as we continue through our day uh, into the remainder of our week. May all that we do be done for the glory and honor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. I will see you next Wednesday morning, Lord willing, and uh, we'll move on to something else. Thanks for being here.